Marilyn Gay, and my pronouns are she, her. We've been asked by our president to uh, identify ourselves as board members, so if you have a bone to pick, you can speak to me. Um, I'm, I'm on the board. I'm your service leader today, assisting Reverend Mo Rosemary Morrison in this service. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together, not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawing from many sources. You see the banners that represent the world religions. These are sources that we draw from. We do hope that you feel welcome here either in our sanctuary or online over Zoom. Um, whatever you believe or not believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, and by the way, it's Family Day weekend, so define family as you wish. Whatever your age, race, or ability, you are all welcome here. We invite you to join us in the journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making for as long as you feel comfortable doing so. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning, and I've already met a couple of them. You'll have a chance to meet them too. We extend a special welcome to our visitors this morning. Please join us after the service for conversation and coffee. Oh, yes. Oh. You know what? I was told not to get too close to the mic because then, oh, that one. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. There's so many fellows around here named Mike, you know. <laughs> and I have to, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, it's hard for me. I don't get feedback, you know, to understand which, uh, which position is correct. Thank you so much. For helping me. Ah, now we'll move along to our land acknowledgement. Uh, this is a quotation from Chief Wilton Littlechild who says, as chief, I welcome you here to Treaty 6 territory. This land has been the traditional region for homelands of the Métis people of Alberta, the Inuit, the ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Santo, Salto and Nakota Sioux people since time immemorial. The recognition of our history on this land is an act of reconciliation and we honor those who walk with us. I wanted to also bring to your attention the fact that our neighboring uh, area, formerly known as Oliver, has changed its name to Wink When to Win which means circle of friends in the Cree language. Um, so we are making progress little by little. Um, now, do we have any announcements from the congregation? Would anyone like to come up and inform us? Ah, Maria. My name is Maria Jenkins, my pronouns are she and her, and my apologies, the joys of having ADHD. About a month ago, I accidentally stole someone's auxiliary cushion from the uh, sanctuary. I found it when we were setting up for a drag show, and at the end of the night, it somehow found its way into my bag. I don't know if it belongs to someone in the congregation or one of the other groups that rents our space, but uh, there is a lost and found in the coat room where it can be put. It's very nice, it's silicon, hexagon, like cushiony stuff. Anyway, um, I didn't mean to steal it, but this sort of thing has been happening to me all my life. <laughs> uh, perhaps, perhaps before Maria leaves, she'll put it in the lost and found bin in the cloakroom. Oh, it found its owner, I'm really glad, okay. Uh, uh, I've, I've got a couple of other announcements. One, you know, customary, please silence your cell phones or your pagers or your uh, 
alarm systems of any sort so that we can concentrate better on our time together. I have an announcement from uh, Carmen Loisel, not, not Kathy, but Carmen, her sister, is a member of Westwood, and she is proposing a special gathering, which I will read from her own words. She says, are you an elder concerned about the climate crisis? Are you already active in climate and related global justice issues? I'm interested in getting people together to talk informally about what activities they're involved in and brainstorm ideas about what they might be able to do together. I also want to give a quick update on efforts to start a national seniors group concerned with the climate crisis. And she's proposing the following. How many of you are seniors here? Hmm, not, not, uh, not a small number. Okay. Um, <laughs> meet on Thursday, February 29th, 2024 at 630 at the Idlewild branch of the Edmonton Public Library for one hour. Please note if the library is on strike, an alternative um, location will be uh, offered. Now, I'm not going to give you the website or her email number, anything like that, because that's too hard to hold in your head during our hour together. But out at the welcoming table, I have written it down, and you clever people with smartphones might want to take a picture. If you wish to RSVP to Carmen to participate in this event. Any other announcements? No. Okay, let's move on to our prelude and begin our contemplation for this, uh, this time together.
Thank you, Gordon. That was lovely. Now I think we're all in the right frame of mind to begin our service. By lighting the chalice, I'm calling Lynn Wolf up to light our chalice. Um, quite often, she's behind the scenes recording our service at home, but we're very happy to have her here today. This is a reading from Reverend Dr. David Breeden. We gather into this circle. We gather into this circle of a care to dream, to envision, to embody, and achieve. The compassion we dream, the justice we envision, the dignity of each, and an ever-growing circle of love and justice. Thank you, Lynn. Now we'll all sing together hymn number 21 from the gray hymnal, or you can see behind me, I think the uh, words will be projected. And uh, we expect all the Coriolis members here to belt it out, and we'll all have fun singing this lovely song. Hymn number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. So, we've got a children's story this morning called Outside In by Deborah Underwood. <sighs> Thank you, Rosemary. That was very meaningful for us to enjoy. Um, now the time in our service has arrived when we have an opportunity to share our abundance. Our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values that we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. May I add 
this is true now more than ever when you notice buckets stationed around parts of our building to collect the melting snow that is um, dripping in from the roof, that, which is soon to be repaired. And the urgent need for this repair makes us more conscious of how important our contributions are. In addition to supporting this, to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Some are local and some national, some international. For the month of February, we're sharing our abundance with iHuman, which is an essential and very important institution in our community serving um, at-risk youth, offering them opportunities for self-expression, for um, nourishment, for, um, and, and especially to develop their art, artistic talents. I have visited their facility and was very impressed with all of the ways that they provide for our at-risk youth. And of course, if our at-risk youth are nurtured um, to adulthood, they can make a better contribution to our city and our province. So, uh, for those in the sanctuary, you can use envelopes found at the desk or in the back of the gray hymnals. Uh, and if you identify your contribution, you will eventually receive a tax receipt because we are, of course, a charitable organization. Um, the unidentified cash is divided in half between our needs and the needs of iHuman. Please indicate on the envelope your contract information. For those of you online, hello there. We're glad that you're also part of this service. Uh, we encourage you to visit iHuman, and I believe the website is posted behind me. Um, the offering will now be received. Receive to you, I give. <laughs> Together we share and bless. Thank you for your generosity and your support. With our, your support is also with time, talents, and money and we support the work of the community in this Unitarian Universalist tradition. So, we've already sung our song, moving right along. <laughs> now it's time for me, as service leader, to reflect on the subject of the day and share my thoughts. Today we're examining our relationship to the environment. And my reflection is very personal. Almost the first thing I do every morning when I take my dog outside, I stand on our deck admiring at least 15 huge mature trees of various species that tower over me. I gaze lovingly at my small cherry trees and plum trees. And depending on the season, it might be freezing or hot dark or bright at 8 o'clock in the morning. When I do this, I feel uplifted and grounded, and I'm ready to start my day, and so is Spot. Like many of you, I try to conserve energy and resources. I drive a hybrid car. We are half-time vegetarians and avid organic gardeners. I support many environmental causes with my activism as a raging granny and as a citizen, and also with charitable donations. I hike in the river valley with friends, and we camp frequently in the in three seasons of the year in our RV. With all of the buckets um, arranged around our building now, the phrase, a drop in the bucket, 
becomes uh, more meaningful as I try to assess what little I do to make a contribution to the well-being of the world. It doesn't really matter if my token efforts have a measurable impact. The choices that I make are personally fulfilling and positive. Taking in the big picture, I vote for leaders that I think will take climate justice forward seriously. At the end of my day, much as I began my day, Spot and I go outside admiring the beauty of the moon and the stars. I like to think that, in small ways, I am part of the interdependent web of life. Now we're going to sing another song. We've got hymn number 1068 in the teal color hymnal, but for your convenience, it is also projected on the wall. Rising Green. <laughs> You. In case you didn't know, that was the stand of Gary Oak. Um, so they grow mostly on the west coast, kind of where you might find madronas or what's the uh, Canadian name of them? Arbutus trees. Arbutus and Gary Oak are usually in the same ecosystem. Whew. Now we're getting cozy. I would. We we're doing candles just a little bit differently this morning in that I'm going to ask for you ask you to speak to your candle if you would like by invitation of course never by demand and so the flow that we think that will work that we have set up Bernard and others and I I think I think this is going to work so bear with me and my head mic is out of power so maybe if I could ask Bernard to demonstrate how we think this should go. <laughs> so I'll be the person that's going to light a candle. 
And then I'll turn it over to Bernard to be the same person. So you would come up, if you wish to speak to your candle, you would come up first and say something like, I'm thinking today about, and I'd like to light a candle for them. And then you would go and light, use the, use the votive to light your taper, and then light a candle, and then douse it and put it in one of those. So all of the candles that are at that end of the table will not light, they're wet. So only the candles at this end of the table will light. So, um, and of course, if you wish to just light a candle, you don't need to come up here and say, I'm going to light a candle, but I'm not going to tell you what it's for, right? You can just light a candle. <laughs> you can just light a candle any time through this time together. And we like candles as a community to help us build community and telling our, each other what our candles are for, what's on our hearts, what, are, what our joy is, is another way that we can build community together. It's important to light candles when we are together. It shows that we're human, that we have cares, that we have a life, that we have joys, that we have troubles, that we have concerns. So I invite you now to come forward and light a candle and either tell us about that, what's going on for you in your life and on your heart, or just simply light a candle. I invite you now. My name is Ferguson Verbicki, and I hope my mom does not do any more acrobatics again, because she's already <laughs> hurt herself. Why is that, Fergie? Why is that, Fergie? Because she's already broken a leg. It's me again. <laughs> uh, last night was the monthly Dragging Youth show here at church. And I've been involved in these shows in one capacity or another for several years. But this week, Karen gave me the social media passwords. So I was able to post to the Dra Dragging Youth Instagram directly, which was pretty great. But also just every time one of these shows happen, Clinton and I kind of look at each other and, and comment on how far some of these young people have come in the time we've known them. Uh, there's one performer who has been performing at these shows here at the church since they were 15 and is just about to turn 24 and is a simply phenomenal dancer who has recovered from a lot of real heavy real life stuff. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have a young person who's only been performing within the last year, and I think they're about 10. And the first couple of times they got up on stage, I was honestly wondering if they were going to decide, I can't do this and physically run away. And now they are so confident and so vibrant on the stage, and it's just so beautiful to see. Good morning. My name is Erica Deneve. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I actually want to do two candles this morning. Um, I caretake a lot of people <laughs> with my job and just in general, and that's been a lot this week. Uh, <laughs> my partner had a retinal detachment last week, so he had surgery. His eyeball's fine. It's all good, but um, there was a lot of stuff with that, and uh, I had some patients with a whole lot going on in their lives, so there was a lot of that as well. And um, and then the other thing is our current provincial government is doing some crazy, crazy things uh, involving transgender care. Um, and since I have a transgender child, um, that particularly affects our household. Um, it doesn't affect my child's um, health care concerns or, or what's going on with them, but just them being trans um, causes them concern for how their government views them. And 
And so we've had a lot of conversations this week and, and last about what the heck is going on with us being the Texas of the North. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're not terribly happy about all of that. But at the same time, we're very happy to see how much positive affirmation has come from places like the Pediatric Association of Alberta and uh, different political figures um, and how affirming that has been for people. So there has been wonderful amounts of support that way as well. Good morning, my name is Brandy Muller-Reed and my pronouns are she and her and I am board president. Um, I got back Monday, I guess, from a lovely family vacation. So my um, first candles of gratitude, not just for a wonderful family vacation, but because of, has, has been mentioned already, the sieve that our roof has turned into. And there have been many fabulous people in this church who have come together over the last few weeks to handle it, even while I was away, and they have done a splendid job. So my uh, first candle is just gratitude for everybody in this church who makes it run and, and pitches in when they do. My second candle is joy, and that is for Fergie's jacket today because it makes me extremely happy, and it's so awesome. So thank you, Fergie. My name is Robert, and I, I light that. <laughs> my name is Robert, and I light a candle in memory of my mom and dad and my sister Betty with love. My name is Karen, my pronouns are she and hers. Um, as Maria mentioned, last night was the one of the monthly Dragon Youth shows. And we raised funds for Dylan's Hope, which is an organization that helps with um, narcotics addiction and support and uh, awareness of overdoses. Um, we raised $860 for them, that was great. Thank you for all the congregation that supports this. And, but last night it brought up a lot of stories of people dealing with addiction and people trying to find help with when their family member is addicted and how supports are disappearing and it's really hard out there. And um, I wanna light candles for all those people that are really struggling. My name is Marilyn Gay. You met me earlier this morning. Um, I'm going to light, there aren't enough unlit candles to cover all of the things that I'm concerned about, but I light two. Um, there have been a few comments and candles uh, lit in support and concern for the GBLTQ and drag community. Um, and I, I echo all of those sentiments. I think it's tragic that the provincial government is targeting a very vulnerable group and um, a, a very small minority, actually, um, and, and threatening their well-being. But also, I'm equally concerned about the plight of homeless people who are living in encampments, being cruelly evicted, having all of their possessions confiscated, and no real help to provide housing and services that will meet their needs. Um, this is another way that people are victimized uh, unfairly and cruelly. And to top it off, is this the cherry on the cake? The city of Edmonton is proposing a bylaw to victimize these people even further. People who are penniless and desperate are going to receive fines for doing what they can't help doing. And then, of course, that may lead to imprisonment and, and more trauma. So all of these things, you know, I think we need to express compassion and concern and show our, our support for these victimized groups in our society. They say the way to judge any society is by the way it treats the most vulnerable.
My name is Audrey Brooks. My pronouns are she and her. I have two candles. One is for the members of our community who are experiencing uh, health issues, like Marg Roach and um, Shirley Edgar. Uh, if you give these people a call, uh, Lynn, Liz Cloutier as well too, that I haven't been able to get to see her for a while. So uh, take a look around you and see who is not here and maybe give them a call. My second one is a request. When Bonnie Sharpland died, she, before she died, she brought over from Nepal the wife of the extended family from, uh, that lived with her and who was part of the schools that she helped develop there. Her name is Gita, and she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Now, uh, Scott has chosen to sell the condominium where uh, Gita is staying, and she has to be out of there by the end of March. Um, if any of you has, has room for her, uh, she's going to be coming to over to my place on the 25th. I uh, would like to come and meet her. That would be very nice. Uh, she is uh, going to be bringing her family over from Nepal eventually, but there is a deadline because the condo is going to be sold out from under her. So talk to me about that. Thank you. And I'd like to ask Marilyn to light one last candle for all of our joys and concerns that we hold in our hearts and our minds. We have spoken a lot of the injustices of the world, and this month's theme is justice and equity, so it is so fitting that we're bringing these things to mind. We're going to move into a time of meditation as... Audrey and Marilyn finish lighting their candles, which is good. Yeah, we can do it all. We can do more than one thing at a time, which is, which is wonderful. So as we come into a time of meditation, I'm invite. We'd like to invite you to be like a cat. Relax. Think about the sun on your face and your body. Wiggle your whiskers, yawn, stretch. If you like, take some big, deep breaths, roll your shoulders. This is a movement meditation, a time of movement to feel your body in your chair, to give your face a rub, if you like, or stretch out your face. It feels so good, doesn't it? When you, I won't do it because I'm on camera, but you know what I mean. You stretch out your face really big. It feels great. <laughs> Sometimes in the morning, I'll, I'll go through every joint in my body and just give it a little, little spin. And that feels really good. I invite you to allow the chair to hold you, the bed, the couch, whatever it is that you are on and to let your body wiggle and move how it ex wishes to express itself. I follow a yoga instructor named Adrian, and she says, find what feels good in your body and do it. So we're going to take a moment, a minute or so of silence together, but in that silence, I invite you to move, to give your hands the massage, to stand and bend, to sway like a tree. We're talking a lot about trees today. See how if maybe we can all stand, if, if you wish, but at some point to stand and act like a tree in the wind with your leaves shimmering. I invite you into silence and much movement and creaking of chairs.
you would like this is you don't have to just sit still I personally am not very good at it so I was at the pool yesterday and there was these two young boys with their grandma and just sitting in the hot tub with her and they were so still and quiet and well behaved I couldn't believe my eyes because my grandsons would not be doing any of that they would be running not running in the pool of course my grandsons wouldn't do that because there's a sign that says don't run <laughs> yes they would but they'd be wondering where the water slide is and all the things so i have something to admit to you i am a tree hugger no not the kind that hangs on to a western red cedar up in the top of the canopy to stop it from being logged, although in a younger, at a younger iteration of myself, I just might have. I'm a tree hugger for a much more selfish reason. I hug trees because I need to. I found when I don't get into the forest on a regular basis and give and receive hugs from trees, I suffer. About a year ago, I suffered a knee injury, and I tried in vain to get into the forest. And, and, but unfortunately, as uh, my son Matthew says, I start dragging my hind leg pretty quickly. It really hurt. And I went to a few different physical therapists, the doctor, and nothing was helping. I, now I have found a great new physical therapist and I am beginning to feel better. My leg is beginning to feel better. I didn't realize until the other day how this forest absence was affecting me. I was chatting with a friend and looking out at the columnar aspens outside my window, and they're budding out right now, like big time. They are, and they're kind of scaring me the way they, um, you're kind of thinking it's spring, but it's not. And we could get a real cold snap, and then they would die. I turned to my friend, and I said, oh, I know what we'll do. I know what I'll do anyway, but you can join me if you like. I'll just go out and bless them and give them a hug. That'll help. And then I realized in that moment that tears were sprouting and running down my face. I hadn't been tree bathing or forest, forest hugging or forest bathing or tree hugging for a long time, and it was negatively affecting me. You see, like Marilyn, trees ground me. I give them my attention. I find a tree that's just perfect. It's about this big around, and it's close to the trail so I don't have to get into icky stuff in case there's dog poop in there. And I just lean into it, and I let it hold me. And it takes, it feels like it takes my care, all my cares and all my worries. And it feels sort of like the tree is hugging me back. And, like, and I have picked like specific trees on White Mud Ravine and Lois Hole. Like I have my trees. And they are my friends. I know they're not hugging me back, but maybe they are. What do you think? I think maybe they are. I think they appreciate the attention as well. I've been reading a book called Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest by Suzanne Samard. I'm going to talk about trees today quite a bit. In her book, she outlines the extensive research and experimentation she has conducted over many years, mostly in British Columbia. She teaches forestry at the University of BC. 
Her experiments and research have, made, have resulted in some amazing discoveries. For example, forests have mother trees, and they send out warnings to other trees if there's any kind of danger on its way. They give out nutrients, water, and carbon to struggling saplings through roots. But not just any sapling. These are mother trees. A mother can determine, picture this, a forest with big trees, little trees, saplings. So like a conifer forest where the cones have fallen maybe two or three years ago. But that mother tree knows which saplings are hers, and she sends out a root or sends out nutrients through the ground to her babies. She knows. I find that incredible. I don't know about you, but it kind of takes my breath away. Samard has discovered that the trees communicate through a fungal network in the soil. She discovered that these fundal, fungal networks look like and act like our own human brains. Even more surprising, she discovered that the chemical signals they put out through the fungal network are identical to our own neurotransmitters. Her work has been groundbreaking and heartbreaking because even though she has proven that there needs to be diversity, that the mother trees must be kept, that herbicides and pesticides destroy the health of the forest. The powers that be continue their practices of destructive clear-cutting. I am a BC girl, you can tell. And so we're not going to talk about clear-cutting today because I don't have it in me and I'll just start to cry. So we'll leave that conversation for another time. But I do want to tell you a little bit about another forest. And maybe another one after that. This one is in Utah, and it's called Pando. It is the largest living organism in the world. It spans 106 acres. Pando is an one aspen, made one aspen root system with over 40, 47,000 cloned stems. It is believed to be about 14,000 years old, making it not only the largest single organism on the planet, but also the oldest. The forest is made up of trees that are formed from suckers off that one root. It has lived happily for so many years at, uh, in Utah uh, at a place called Fish Lake, there's a fish lake in every, every little part of every little province of every little state. It's lived happily for so many years, and now due to human activity, it is threatened. Encroachment, destructive, destruction of ecosystems, the lack of deer predators. So the deer are eating the bark of the saplings and that kind of thing, but, they're not, but they don't have any, any uh, predators. Pollution, other factors are creating huge problems for Pando. There are organizations that have formed to, to save Pando, but some are worried it might be too late. Look it up. It's really interesting. I've just kind of discovered Pando in the last couple of weeks. Imagine one tree, 106 acres, 47,000 cloned stems. The last tree I'd like to talk about is the Gary Oak, and we saw the Gary Oak earlier during the Rising Green song. I lived in a Gary Oak meadow uh, in the Cowichan Valley for a few years, and I found it quite delightful to say the very least. There is a relationship, a symbiotic relationship between the Ga Gary Oak and the camas flower and bulb. The First Nations people on Vancouver Island cultivated the camas for food. And they would burn off an area so that they could get to the ground and so it would nurture the ground as well. But the, ca but the Gary Oaks wouldn't burn off. So the, ga the camas and the Gary Oak began a relationship thousands of years ago. 
and so it, it exists today. Usually, if you are in a, if you are near or in a Gary Oak stand, there will be camas bulbs under your feet. These bulbs were basically farmed by the First Nations people. They are very nutritious, delicious, and a valuable source of starch, and were a trading commodity pre-contact. And apparently when James Douglas of the Hudson's Bay Trading Company saw the camas fields, he thought he'd saw Eden. He just thought they randomly appeared. He did not realize that the First Nations people had actually farmed them. And they are beautiful. They're pur they have purple, purple, fl purple flowers. Gary oaks are protected in Canada, however, they are very much in danger and their symbiotic relationship with the can camas is waning as the ground is plowed under and houses built, etc. Suzanne Simard, author of Finding the Mother Tree, is from a very long line of foresters and has researched the devastating effects of clear-cut logging and deforestation. She is sounding the alarm, and in one of her TED Talks, which I listened, I watched, I don't know, a week or so ago, and I thought to myself, there's my sermon. I should just show the TED Talk, and then we can have a conversation afterwards. But I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't go for it. So I learned that Canada deforests more more forests than any other country in the world, and it's unsustainable. It's almost 4%. Um, so more than Brazil, which we consider Brazil to be doing damage to the earth. BC is worse, or Canada. Unless we stop thinking about forests as lumber and the ground as mineral and oil, we are never going to survive because our survival is dependent upon the survival of a myriad, a huge amount of species. I am of an age when parents put their kids out after breakfast, hoping not to see them till lunch, feed them lunch, and then send them back out till dinner, and then back out until the street lights came on. And because I was that kid, I explored the fields, the marshes, the hills, the brambles, all over, the beehives, the anthills, making things out of sticks. And I was listening to David Suzuki, I don't know, a few years ago, and his point, unless we're connected to the natural world, we're not going to protect it. So the kids aren't, of course, I'm not proposing that anyone send their kids out after breakfast and not see them again till lunch. Not a good idea. Um, but unless we are connected, we won't see it as an organism to be protected, but rather a commodity to be harvested and dug out of the ground. So what does all of this have to do with us here at UCE? When I think of the interconnectedness of the pando plant, or the way that the fir and the birch talk to one another, or how a mother tree can find her offspring and will send it extra nutrition through the fungal network, I am reminded that we too are interconnected. Like the mother tree, we can send off nourishment to those who need it. We have a Care and Connections team, Gloria Krenbrink heads that up. You can read about it in the monthly newsletter. Basically, if you are in need of a meal or a ride, you can let Gloria know. And then she has a bunch of people that have said, you know, sometime I can do a meal or I can do a ride. And then she'll put those people together. And they will symbiotically, through a network of telecommunication, instead of fungal, fungi, fungi. It's not a fun guy, it's a fungi. Uh, we'll provide a meal or a ride and bingo. We look after one another. The newly forming pastoral care team of Med, and we are excited to be working together with the congregation to look after one another in a more fulsome way. It is everyone in the community that is needed. Not all the time, but everyone is needed and everyone is wanted. We create community and become connected when we do activities together, like being part of Coriolis, 
lighting candles, being here this morning, coming out to UU's on tap on the last Monday of the month. I've been hosting a third Friday of the month get together to encourage us to build community. Last Friday, two days ago, was spaghetti and karaoke night. We were a small but mighty crowd. <laughs> we raised the roof and we missed you, those of you who weren't there. Remember, it's not about the spaghetti. Oh, yes, it is. Well, I made the spaghetti. It was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. But um, it's not just about like the activities. It's about building community. So some people, I don't like karaoke. Well, it's not about the karaoke. It's about getting together and building community. How can we mimic the natural world? Nature has all the blueprints we need to be successful. We just need to learn from her. What do you think we're doing right now to build community? Any thoughts? What are we doing right now to build community? If you have any thoughts, you can shout them out. I'll read them out. I'll repeat them into the microphone. Or another question. What do you think we could be doing better or differently to help build community here at UCE? How can we learn from the forest, the mother trees, the Pando forest, the Gary Oak meadows? Any ideas? I'll just give you a few seconds because, you know, time. Walking group, there's a walking group, that's right. Lighting spoken candles, we need to do that, don't we? Yeah, we learn about one another. Yeah, trying to bring that back in a little more often. Yeah, any other ideas? I got, so we had walking group, lighting spoken candles. We could go walking in the park across from our church on a nice day. Oh, uh, there's an off-leash park. And I would like to suggest, humbly, that we stick around after church, get another cup of coffee, and visit with one another instead of taking off in a big hurry. I have heard from newcomers that it is disconcerting when we all just take off. They don't have anybody. They go... Where'd they all go? It's not that, that welcoming. So I'd like to encourage you to grab another cup of coffee after every service. And if there's a treat, eat it, because that would be lovely. And um, talk to one another. Talk to somebody you don't know. That is building community. That there is a group that goes to Albert's after church, and I'm asking them to wait five minutes before they go. <laughs> I believe, so if you are new, there is a group that goes to Albert's after the service for lunch, and you are welcome to join them. It is an open group. 124th and I think about 105th Street, 106th Street. It's got a yellow awning. It's Albert's. Yeah, there's lots, there's lots of room there, and the food is good and reasonably priced. So I believe that we all wish to be part of a vibrant, busy, supported, supportive, and loving community. I believe that strongly, that that's what everyone wants. We also wish to be something greater than ourselves and to feel like we're doing something important that improves the lives of people in the community and outside of our community. My hope is that together, if we all pull in the same direction, that we'll get there. So may it be. Amen. And now, everyone's favorite hymn, and if you're new to us, it will soon be yours too, Blue Boat Home, hymn 1064 in the Teal hymn book. And the words are already behind me. I can tell by the light. I saw the light. Please rise in body and or in spirit and sing together. Blue Boat Home.
Aren't we all good singers? <laughs> I thought that was really beautifully sung, and thank you. Now it's time to bring our service to a close. Only approximately 10 minutes behind the schedule, but who's counting? Really, you get, you get your money to the end of this, don't you? Yes, with all this. Um, we're going to extinguish our chalice. I'll call Lynn to just wait while I do a little reading and then squelch that flame in the chalice. Um, the reading I'm going to give is one that I found to be very thought-provoking. So um, it may stimulate your thinking as you listen as well. It's uh, a poem by um, Reverend Tess Bomberger. We are your hands. We are your hands upon this earth. May we touch each other with gentle strength, offering healing, comfort, expressing love. Your arms are our arms. Give us strength to build the world according to the blueprints of compassion. We are your voice unto the nations. May we speak words of comfort, hope, and sing bravely songs of justice. Your feet are our feet. Guide them on the paths of righteousness, and when we become lost, find us. We are your body on this earth. Renew us who are acting in the world that we may experience your joy in the doing. Before we end, I'd just like to give a word of thanks to everyone that participated in the service and contributed Musicians, thank you, Doug, for the great slides and finding the Kitty Cat video. I really <laughs> loved that. Thank you. Tech, all the, there's so many people that take part in the service and make it go. So I'm, and I'm so deeply grateful. And I offer you these words of benediction. But before I do, I want to remind you to stay for coffee and visit with one another. Get to know one another. Maybe talk to someone that you haven't yet met. Go in hope, for the arc of the universe is long, and together we can bend it toward justice. And go in courage, for we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily world, daily lives, and the larger world, and go in love. Because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform the world. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. Amen. And now we will sing our linking song, our ending song. If you're new, we stand and get our eyes falls hurt and um, hold hands if you want the words of our linking song. We'll come up. We'll sing through twice.